thank you very much for the to the foregoing panel. That was really interesting. So as Geraldine says, I'm going to talk about policy and advocacy at the Alliance, including what the Policy and Advocacy Committee is up to. Um, so first of all, um, it is a, a core remit of the Alliance to engage in policy and advocacy. And I remember right back to the beginning before NIDOS, which is the former name of the Alliance, before it was formed, it was George Reed, MSP, who said, I need to speak, be able to speak to you as a group. So it was the initiative to setting up NIDOS, which became the Alliance. So the policy and advocacy remit of the Alliance is specifically to convene conversations, dialogue and connections with decision makers and to maintain a collective voice on issues related to international development. A lot of this is done through the policy and advocacy committee of which I'm co-chair along with Simon. So Simon earlier in um, this afternoon he spoke about what the the policy committee does and it includes quarterly meetings with the Scottish Government um, and the Scottish Minister for International Development um, it is the Secretariat for the Cross-Party Group on International Development at Holyrood which is a very standing CPG likewise go back goes back to George Reid MSP and it maintains relationships with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO, and its ministerial team, the International Development Committee of, of the House of Commons, and with MPs and shadow spokespeople on international development. So there's a lot about the committee on the Alliance website, including an events page, so you can find out how to join in with a lot of this. Um, and so to look at what we've done in the past year, it links to the strategic objectives of the Alliance, the 2020 to 23 strategic objectives, which are threefold, an effective and well-supported international development sector in Scotland, an engaged and supportive Scottish public, an international development sector that is well connected, listened to and understood by decision makers. So the policy and advocacy work supports all of these, and um, perhaps particularly the third, and um, this is similar to the previous strategic plans. So this has been ongoing for quite some years. So the policy committee um, in 2016, at the start of this last strategic plan period, um, the board of the Alliance, which was then called NIDOS, set out a plan to reconvene a policy group as a subcommittee of the board to make sure that we're meeting our strategic objectives in these areas. And by 2017, the policy committee was re-established, given a terms of reference, support from Alliance staff and a new chair, Simon Anderson, who then went on to become the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Alliance. And representatives from nine member organisations joined the committee for its first meeting in 2017, and it has met quarterly or more ever since then. We now have over 10 permanent members, including from the private sector, universities, small NGOs and large NGOs. So we aim to reflect the diversity of members of the Alliance. And the work over the last three years, the policy committee has worked on many briefings, consultation responses and written submissions at both Westminster and Holyrood to make sure that Scotland's international development sector has a voice on these matters. We've maintained a strong consistent position on policy coherence for sustainable development, PCSD, which has culminated in the creation of a new report and a wiki on the subject, which brings together the work of many organisations and individuals. And you can again have a look at these on the Alliance website. This year has been a very busy year, as you can imagine. And um, we did fight hard against the FCO DFID merger. We got over 100 organisations to sign up to our open letter to the Prime Minister. And in the midst of the pandemic, we managed to bring together skills and expertise to produce our latest report, which is our 23 page vision for the next Scottish Parliament, which Lewis will now introduce. Lewis will also speak about the results of the polling that we commissioned last week on matters that support our recommendations. So Lewis, over to you 
for the next part, please. Thanks, Cathy, uh, and uh, thanks to the wonderful panel that um, was, uh, was led the conversation. Uh, for the first part of this afternoon's conversation, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, as Cathy said, uh, my name is Lewis Ryder jones uh, I'm going to talk about our uh, policy priorities for the next Scottish Parliament, which I think hopefully will link into some of the stuff that uh, has all been already been mentioned and also what's coming with our keynote speaker a bit later. Um, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive at the Alliance and uh, I've been working with the Policy Committee since its inception back in 2017 and I'm really proud of the work that it's done uh, and, and, and uh, supporting it has been a real honour uh, over these past few years. Um, our manifesto priorities for the Scottish Parliament um, came about after uh, quite a long process over the course of uh, this year, starting back in the spring, uh, coinciding really with the beginning of, of, of lockdown in the UK, uh, actually. Um, the Policy Committee uh, put a lot of effort into drafting the first, the first round of uh, kind of main broad areas that we wanted to focus on. Um, and then that went out to uh, uh, a published draft document in, in, in early summer um, uh, this year, which allowed us to consult with our entire membership um, on the draft paper uh, to get some feedback, which was which was which was massively useful and important to, to building a more uh, to building consensus behind our asks on the one hand, but also to 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 ensure that what we were asking for was uh, what the alliance and our members uh, genuinely seek to uh, for the next Scottish government to implement. Uh, the final process of drafting took place in September and uh, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that, the, that there were a couple of issues that we really needed to focus down on and one of them was safeguarding. Uh, the other thing was a thematic funding round and I think this, this goes back to the complexity question that came up slightly earlier. Um, complexity in, in international development I think is often overlooked, especially when we talk about the, the, the cross-cutting natures of certain issues um, and a thematic uh, approach to uh, funding can can sometimes help with this because it allows to 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 cross into different areas through through one theme. Um, we also f got feedback that the uh, the way in which we framed policy coherence, which Cathy alluded to uh, at the start, uh, did not put enough importance onto the nature crisis. Um, we didn't focus down on that in the manifesto in the, in the final draft, and I'll come to that uh, a little bit later, but it's something that we think is vital and that we want to build support with uh, the environmental community uh, and sector in Scotland on building an understanding of PCSD that is uh, rooted in both nature and human development. So what's in our policy priorities report and our manifesto document for political parties? Well, I think to, to to, to sum up, really, we're clearly at a critical juncture. Uh, joined up thinking has never been more important. Um, we know that the Scottish Government's small international development fund uh, is not the be all and end all of what Scotland can do and how it can influence and how it can impact upon the world at large. So we framed everything we've said in this document with that in mind, that actually this is about more than funding. This is about thinking about what we do through a lens that considers its impacts upon the most marginalised and vulnerable across the world. We have uh, put our recommendations into five broad areas of policy coherence, the economy, climate justice, funding and global citizen education. I've got a little quote here that um, our colleague at the OECD passed over for, f to me when we were writing the final draft of our document that I think really sums up the importance of policy coherence and why we frame our own asks around this particular area so strongly. It is about understanding barriers to, to, to sustainable development and it is about being able to think about the economic, social and environmental dimensions of what we're doing, not just when it comes to external affairs, but also through everything else that we're doing. So what's our big ask? Well, 
when we were discussing how to bring together many of the areas that we want to see a future Scottish government commit to around improving and enhancing the coherence across different areas of what they do, we realised that actually the mechanisms in place to help uh, different parts of government and society work together uh, and to set objectives that were meaningful was, was perhaps missing. Um, Scotland's been on a long journey to this regard and, and we're getting there, but we realised that there, are, that there, there, there was a need and still is to, to really focus down on what it means to focus on well-being and sustainable development. And that's why uh, we proposed that political parties should put forward a well-being and sustainable development bill during the next parliament. This bill, in our view, should ensure that there are statutory requirements, not only on government departments, but also on public bodies and local authorities to set sustainable development objectives that take into consideration their global impact. Um, but it should also allow the parliament to have a role in scrutiny and in, in ensuring that systematic scrutiny of policy uh, in its, at its inception is done in a way that thinks about the impacts to, on other parts of the world, including our environment and the people in different countries. We also think this requires leadership from the top, so coordination mechanisms can't come out from, from one minister's office alone. It must be coordinated across a variety of, of ministries. In our manifesto document, as I said at the start, we also focused on other areas. I just want to pull out a couple of those because I, I really don't want to uh, take too much time away from um, the next part that I'm going to talk about, which is the polling area. Um, on funding, our, our members told us that the International Development Fund is important. And although small, it does hugely impactful work across the world, some of which one of our panelists, Karimi, mentioned earlier in Zambia. But we think this is the right time to improve and expand that fund. Uh, and our members uh, told us this repeatedly throughout the consultation process. To do so means not just uh, continuing the current funding programming that exists in our partner countries, but also in expanding it uh, at a time when global sustainable development has never been more important. We were told by our members that the funding uh, process uh, and the funding structure of particular thematic issues could be really useful. But we were also told that these shouldn't be limited to our partner countries. And the complexity of issues facing planet Earth right now necessitate that we allow for South-South learning and as, as, as was alluded to during the conversation and learning between our partner countries from elsewhere through, 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 the, through the organizations and um, policy uh, that the government um, commits to. We also focus down on climate and the Climate Justice Fund has been a real success in Scotland. It's one of the only funds in the world, but we think that should be expanded and increased. Again, uh, we know that the climate crisis is, is, is such, a, such an important issue and with COP just around the corner coming to, coming to Scotland, what better time than to increase it? We were really happy to see one of our, one of our, one of our asks on climate uh, come to fruition this weekend at the SNP conference with a promise to to include a, an indicative NDC at the uh, before the COP next year, um, but championing championing global climate finance at COP 26 is absolutely vital. In the economy, we think it's time we agree with the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and others that it's time to move beyond GDP. We want to see more support for fair trade and we want to see public and uh, public procurement, public policy and leadership in, in business practice in Scotland to support sustainable development in every way. Uh, we also want to see the continued support for the development education centres in Scotland. We, we, we can't do what we do as a sector without, uh, without uh, uh, ensuring that young people have the skills to, to see the world through, through a lens that, that allows for progressive, sustainable development. So why should political parties back these asks? Well, uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've been working as a policy committee to get together some polling to find out well, what, what, what does Scotland think of these asks? We know our membership support them. We know the 200 plus members uh, Ninety-one percent of them, in fact, uh, uh, support directly these asks, and, and the ones that didn't just wanted to see more asks. Um, 
We know that uh, the Scottish Government wants to have an effective development programme. But what about the Scottish public? Well, last week we commissioned some polling uh, at a, probably both a, a difficult time, uh, given the announcement at UK level to cut ODA, but also also uh, at an important time as, 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 as political parties are, are finalising their own manifestos for next, year, next year's election. Um, and at that polling, we found out that nearly three in four adults think it's important that the Scottish Government ensure the global effects of policy decisions made in Scotland are taken into account. Just over two thirds of people place importance in the Scottish Government taking an active role in working towards peace, equality and sustainability globally. And a majority of Scots support the Scottish Government's international development humanitarian aid spending, with just over 60% saying it should be increased or stay the same. For us, this is a clear message that the Scottish Government should and can continue supporting uh, those uh, around the world who are marginalised uh, or vulnerable, and that the Scottish Government can and should do so uh, with the backing of the Scottish public. It also says to us that the idea of policy decisions in Scotland impacting on other people uh, is something that the Scottish public care about. They want to see a Scottish government commit to actions that not only benefit Scotland, but ensure they don't do harm elsewhere. Uh, and I think that is both a, 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 a sign that the, 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 the public are, are willing to uh, get behind current action on PCSD, but also that more needs to be done. It was also interesting to do some work over the past month or so with the Development Agent uh, Engagement Lab uh, based in the University College of London. Um, and we, uh, who have a long-term programme funded by the Gates Foundation to track attitudes to aid and, aid and development across the UK over a five-year period. We asked them for some data and some analysis on some of the work that they had been doing uh, uh, across attitudes to aid and give us a comparison between the UK and Scotland. Um, and what's interesting is we can say that the Scots are very much more likely to increase, uh, to support increasing the UK aid budget. Although I must be frank, that doesn't necessarily mean that a majority of the UK, uh, of the Scottish population necessarily support aid all the time. These are snapshots and most more recent polling done last week shows that actually there is a significant drop in support for the aid budget as the UK ODA cuts were announced last week. But Scottish respondents do see the world as interconnected, which links back to what our own polling suggests from last week. And crucially, Scottish people are more likely to say that the UK aid should be based, should be given based on need, not in the national interest. I think this goes, this, this smacks in the face of much of what uh, the rhetoric, increasing rhetoric coming out from uh, the UK government on where aid should, how and why aid should be given. Uh, and I think we should, we should stand proud in Scotland uh, for, for, for knowing that. Nonetheless, all of these are snapshots and there is uh, a distrust in uh, the UK aid sector uh, more widely that is shared in Scotland and we should not rest on our laurels uh, around these issues. So what next? Well, I think we can't assume anything. I think that's the first mo most important thing. I think we do have a lot more to do on uh, persuading the public that aid and development is important. Um, I think maybe we might hear in our next session uh, from our keynote speaker that it maybe it is time to reframe aid and development. Maybe there are issues being explored here uh, that, that, that are problematic through the language we use. Um, I suppose for us within this particular session, we want to see you get behind our election asks. We want to see you get behind the elec uh, election asks of our members uh, and we want you to, to help us spread that message because ultimately if we can't uh, assume anything on attitudes to these, these issues from the wider public, then, it is, then it's on us, those who care about it, to make sure that we talk about these issues and, 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 and tell them why they're important. And when those candidates come knocking next spring, uh, let's make sure we 
uh, get them behind them too. So uh, I, will, I will I will leave it at that, Cathy, and hand back to you.